All right. Well, good evening and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another wellness webinar series event with Jefferson Health. Well, my name is Sarah Breckbill, and I will be serving as your program moderator. Now, there are 48 million people in the U.S. dealing with some level of hearing loss. Experts from Jefferson's Cochlear Implant Program and Balance and Hearing Center are here this evening to answer your questions about signs of hearing loss, needs assessments and hearing tests that are available, and audiological conditions like ringing or buzzing in the ears. We will also discuss current technology and treatment options available, which vary based on level of hearing loss, individual lifestyle, and other factors. Well, thank you so much for submitting your questions in advance of tonight. And the questions that you'll hear me asking the panelists are all submitted right from when you registered for this webinar. And if you have any questions throughout our discussion tonight, for those joining us on your computer or tablet, at the bottom of your screen, you should see an icon that says Q&A. Now we'll do our very best to get to as many questions as possible, but may not be able to answer all of them during tonight's virtual event. And due to hospital and university guidelines and privacy, we are unable to comment on specific cases. Likewise, if you are experiencing any symptoms that may require immediate medical attention, please consult a medical professional. Well, with that, I wanna go ahead and introduce our experts for the evening. Uh, so I'll have each one of you introduce yourself and give a little background. Uh, so to start us off, uh, let's go ahead and kick it off with Dr. Anna Bixler, Clinical Audiologist and Amplification and Tinnitus Program Coordinator. So welcome, how are you doing this evening? And I think you might be on mute. There you go. Hi. I'm doing well this evening. Um, so to give a little background, I've been with Thomas Jefferson University for getting close to four years now. Um, loved every minute of it. And um, I did my graduate work at University of Pittsburgh. Um, had a really great team of um, professors, clinical rotations, all of that for a lot of well-rounded training. And that's really where my passion in in terms of hearing aids, amplification, all of that started. I had a professor who was really encouraging, Dr. Katherine Palmer. Um, she really motivated me to kind of pursue that, that niche within audiology, but I of course love all aspects. Um, and since I've been at Jefferson, that has only grown and kind of led into the role of amplification and tinnitus coordinator. Um, so I mainly work on, you know, ensuring that best practices are used in all things related to hearing aids, tinnitus, making sure our patients are well taken care of um, and kind of growing our programs in that manner. Um, and personally, I live in East Falls, uh, Germantown area. I live with my roommate and puppy Piper. Amazing. Well, welcome, and we're so excited to have you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Next up, uh, Dr. Lauren Lucas, a clinical audiologist and cochlear implant clinical coordinator. How are you doing this evening? I'm good. How are you? Good. A lot of mouthfuls in the titles, right? <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you acknowledging. <laughs> but welcome. We're excited to have you. Thank you. Um, so I actually started after undergrad, I uh, was a hearing instrument specialist, which really started my passion in audiology. Um, I worked in that position for about three years and decided I wanted to know more. You know, I was working with just hearing aids and I really, you know, didn't branch out until um, to see like cochlear implants and balanced patients. So I really, you know, decided I wanted to go back to school. Um, I did my graduate degree at Salis University in Elkins Park. So I really didn't you know, steer far from Philadelphia. Um, I've been at Jefferson for um, a little over two years now. I actually did my residency year here as well. So obviously I loved it so much. I just wanted to continue my work here. Um, I took over the role as cochlear implant clinical coordinator back in March. So my job has been to really make sure that we're doing best practices, making sure we're really efficient with our testing and making sure to get patients in in a timely fashion. Um, so I'm excited to be here tonight. Yes. Well, welcome. Uh, and finally, Dr. Jacob Hunter with Otology Neurotology Division Chief. Uh, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing very well. Thank you. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for asking. <laughs> yes. So um, I've actually been at Jefferson since March of this year. I, um, I'm originally from California. 
I went to med school at Albert Einstein in the Bronx, did my residency in otolaryngology at Albert Einstein in the Bronx. I ended up doing a two-year neurotology fellowship at Vanderbilt in Nashville. And then I was at UT Southwestern in Dallas for seven years and became a very busy cochlear implant surgeon in Dallas and really, really catapulted my career. I mean, now I'm I'm part of a health hearing hearing health collaborative think tank. It's a group of audiologists, surgeons, and policy leaders that are trying to spread the word as well as investigate why hearing loss is not something that we talk about, say like diabetes management or blood pressure. Um, and obviously you're talking to three of us who are very biased individuals. And so um, my wife and I were called, uh, I guess about two years ago to come to Jefferson. My wife happens to be from Wilmington, Delaware. That's why a California kid lives in Philly now, but um, to, uh, to help help, spread the word about hearing loss and to discuss hearing loss journey with patients from beginning to end. So thank you. Amazing. Well, with that, um, I know our audience is very excited to get into our discussion tonight. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and just dive into the questions. I know that we've received a lot already. Um, so to kick us off, Dr. Hunter, I will start with you. Uh, the most popular question by far that we've received for this webinar is about tinnitus or ringing and buzzing in the ears. Um, so can you just go ahead and discuss what this is, possible causes, and ultimately how to manage it? So um, I'm going to essentially come across my spiel as what I would be telling my patients. And I think one thing we should emphasize is that we, the three of us, probably approach this maybe slightly differently in the way we counsel patients. And what we talk about might not necessarily be the same as our partners or at other institutions. I mean, the gestalt's the same. But essentially, I tell patients hearing loss, or sorry, tinnitus is a symptom of hearing loss. And so the best way I try to describe it in layman's terms to patients is it's though the, the brain is not receiving the input that it once had, and it's almost making that sound that the patient is perceiving. And, and there are different forms of tinnitus. There is uh, objective tinnitus that we can actually measure. Uh, something that we always ask about is, is your tinnitus a cricket or a ringing or static or white noise from the old televisions, or is it your pulse? And so when we start talking about the pulse, we actually talk about a vascular related issue that might be driving it. Uh, there could be some anatomical issues going on that we could identify via imaging. Uh, but if we're talking a non-pulsatile nature of the tinnitus, uh, then we're talking about more something along the auditory pathway. And so we first start with pretty much most of the patients we all see uh, with an audiogram. We start with pure tone audiometry to measure their um, basic ability to hear beeps and tones, if you will, as well as assessing a word recognition test. And it's literally just two syllable words in a quiet room with no challenges, pretty basic tests. These are tests that are almost approaching hundred years old. Um, and it gives us an idea of what is happening from an ear perspective. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, I mean, you can have someone with defined normal hearing that still has tinnitus and somebody that has profound hearing loss. I mean, they are bottom, bottom down. And sometimes they're like, no, I don't have anything. And so I, I talk to patients about, well, wh where their hearing is at, wh what are they doing or in terms of or their needs for hearing aids, or I should say their needs for their demands for their hearing, hearing in their life. And so do we talk about hearing aids? Um, do we talk about, we always talk about their ear health, history of infections, uh, drainage and pain. Um, and then we talk about some strategies. Um, this is a conversation that is a difficult conversation, something that I definitely share uh, with uh, the audiologists as well as other uh, otolaryngologists, but it's something that we, we talk about sound therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I do mention that there is no randomized controlled trial that shows that a medication or a supplement supersedes placebo. So depending on how the conversation going is going, I, I might actually joke. I mean, you could buy a five pound pack of gummy bears and you might get the same response as if you took a lipoflavonoid, which the data suggests. So, um, or I should say the data does not suggest taking one of those over a placebo. Um, but I recognize diff there's different answers for different patients. Um, and I, I also, I mean, I, I recognize I might connect with the patient better than others. And I recognize sometimes the audiologists connect better with the patient than I do. Okay. Well, thank you. And I know you kind of nodded to it, but are there any treatments or cures available? 
I think cure is a way too strong a word. No, I would not call it a cure. I, I the the way I describe it is we want patients to be in control of their tinnitus. We do not want the tinnitus to be in control of the patient. And there are many strategies that patients can employ so that they can take control of their tinnitus. And sometimes patients come in early on in the process and are able to kind of get around it and are doing well. Other people have gone down the rabbit hole and have explored a number of options and maybe not, uh, it just have not found that solution, not found that strategy. And so I, I, I would never tell a patient there's a cure, uh, but I would tell a patient that there can be a solution so that they can take control of their tinnitus. Is that, can I tell any individual patient which strategy works for them? No. Uh, I, I think it's kind of a trial and error and figuring out what works for that patient um, best uh, through a trial and error process. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. Uh, okay. Dr. Bixler, we will turn to you now to talk a little bit about balance and hearing loss, uh, which was another popular question that we received. Um, so can you just describe a little bit about how they are related? Yeah, so the, the organs of balance and the primary organ of hearing are all housed in the inner ear capsule. So they're all in the same space. So essentially, you know, there can be disorders that can affect both of them, um, but they can also affect them separately. So um, in terms of, you know, deficits in, in each, they are still separate systems. Um, but interestingly enough, too, there is data and research on untreated hearing loss, increasing fall risk, things like that. A lot of what we attribute that to is it's not really causational research. It's more so research of, you know, okay, there's a heightened link of this. And a lot of times what we think of with that is poor spatial awareness. If we have an untreated hearing loss, we have poor spatial awareness around us because sound has been limited. Um, so that's something that can kind of play into that a little bit as well. But certainly, you know, uh, like viral infection, things that can affect both the organs of hearing and organs of balance in the inner ear capsule can coincide and, you know, occur together, but they can also occur separately. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. All right, Dr. Hunter, we will jump back to you now to talk a little bit about cochlear devices. Um, so is there criteria for someone to get an implant and do they help in just one ear or can they help in both? Um, and ultimately, do they really work? <laughs> I hope they work. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and that's a nuanced conversation, right? The, the way that question's phrased is kind of nuanced. I mean, technically, we can apply everyone on this entire webinar, but the insurance might not pay for it. So there is an agreed upon criteria based on a, a patient's insurance, whether your insurance would pay for an implant. Um, Medicare lagged behind that standard, or I should say lagged behind the private standard until October of last year. That was actually a 10-year lobbying effort to match the private criteria. Um, so there is a specific benchmark um, that we are looking at so that, I mean, essentially what we're trying to assess is would somebody do better with a cochlear implant than they're currently doing with their hearing aids? And so I, I think it's a, a mis, it's a mistake to counsel patients. And this is a conversation that I have with other otolaryngologists and audiologists to state, oh, if someone's no longer benefiting from hearing aids that they should get a cochlear implant. Absolutely but we're still able to implant patients that are doing okay with the hearing aid. I mean, our job is to improve your quality of life, anybody's quality of life. And so, and that is our big concern. We, we obviously don't want to take a step back. Um, that, that, that's the big question. When can we put an implant in so that we're maximizing your quality of life? And I honestly think we've been very conservative and we're just starting to get more and more aggressive, but there is a percentage that we are looking at on the test that evaluates whether a patient's a cochlear implant candidate to determine whether or not that insurance would pay for it. Now, uh, I've had patients inquire that didn't, didn't meet that standard. How much would it cost for out-of-pocket expenses? But there's a reason why that standard exists because that's where the data suggests that, hey, listen, your hearing's pretty bad. We put an implant in there. You're probably going to do pretty well, much better than what you are currently. We, we'd obviously never promised that, but we are very comfortable and confident the way we counsel patients. But what this consists of is a, a hearing aid, and I'm, I'm probably going to steal Anna's thunder here real quick, but a hearing aid just amplifies the sound in the ear. It just turns up the pressure wave. Sound is a, a pressure wave. 
A cochlear implant is actually a wire that we place in the cochlea. Uh, the cochlea literally looks like a little snail shell that's in the inner ear. Maybe if you, you stuck your finger in your, don't try this, but if you stuck your finger in your like knuckled it, maybe you, you'd definitely get the cochlea. So what we do is we drill a tunnel behind, we make an incision behind the ear, drill a tunnel down to the cochlea, place the wire in the cochlea. And so what turns out in these patients, the cochlea is not working anymore. It's not able to fire the nerve. And so we put a microphone on the outside, that microphone takes the sound in, turns it into an electrical energy, that energy then goes down that wire and now fires the nerve. So we, we tell people they have a sense of normal hearing loss. We tell people the nerve isn't working, but in reality, the nerve still works. Yes, the nerve cells, we might not have the same number of nerve cells that we have as the day we were born. And we know that's the case, but the nerve still works. Now, if I cut the nerve from some surgical issue, an implant won't work. But as long as that cochlea is there, as long as there's a nerve there, people get input. Um, and we are very, very, very confident in people doing well. I, I mean, there is a number of research studies that we've explored previously at my prior institution uh, to note that like most patients are telling us like, I wish they did this, I wish I did this sooner. Um, and we also are comfortable to tell people that they might qualify, but we do not think it's the best interest to maybe for that patient to pursue a cochlear implant. I was raised and taught to treat others as I would want to be treated. So I try to approach that counsel to patients. And if, if it's someone that's perhaps in Medicare, I'm, I'm looking at them as my parents and I, I have no problem telling somebody that might qualify. That's maybe just over the edge and they're, they're doing okay on that. They're hearing aid to like, maybe it's not your time just yet. Maybe, maybe let's wait another year or two. Um, but it, it is a very successful neural prosthesis. I mean, obviously, I mean, we are biased, but arguably it's by far the most successful neural prosthesis in, in medicine. All right, well, thank you and exciting to hear. Um, okay, Dr. Lucas, anything you wanna add there? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of information out there and I have a lot of times people coming to me and they hear the word implant and then, you know, we tell them, oh no, you actually still have to wear something on the outside. So, you know, there still is a device that needs to be worn for these implants. Um, a lot of times too, it's really realistic expectations. Um, you know, when you get the implant and it gets turned on, you're not hearing how you did years and years ago when your hearing is normal. You know, it takes a lot of practice and a lot of work on the patient's end to really essentially learn how to hear again. Um, you're hearing an electronic signal, not an acoustic signal like we're used to. So, a lot of times when people are activated at first, they say, you know, things sound very robotic or people sound like Mickey Mouse. Um, so it's always fun to hear kind of people's perception of what, what I sound like at that appointment. Um, but the more that I talk, the more they hear loved ones talk, you know, they, like Dr. Hunter said, they wish they did it sooner. You know, it just really changes their quality of life. It's, it's amazing to see. Okay. Yeah, great to hear. Thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Bixler, we will turn to you. And know Dr. Hunter mentioned a little bit about hearing aids, so let's get into that. Uh, do hearing aids help all hearing loss? And is there a difference between over-the-counter and prescription hearing aids? Yeah, so, I mean, in terms of, you know, when, when does a patient qualify for hearing aids, there is a very, very wide range of qualification. That could be from an extremely slight or mild hearing loss could be at all frequency ranges, could be at just a few, all the way down to a more severe to profound hearing loss range. Uh, oftentimes in more of that severe to profound range, we're looking not only at their sensitivity to sound, but also their processing. And there can be some distortive factors that go into a sensory neural hearing loss because of that damage in the system. There are some nonlinear functions in the cochlea that can degrade over time and can lead to you know, poor outcomes with hearing aids. That's when we might explore cochlear implants. Um, but in terms of qualification for hearing aids, you know, there's a very, very wide range. And oftentimes, a lot of what we take into account, as well as the, the audiometric data from a patient, is their function in daily life. Where are they seeing deficits? I could see two people with the exact same audiogram. One person is struggling daily, and another person says, I notice difficulty here and there, but you know, honestly, I, I just don't notice it that much. Um, and that really plays on to what kind of environments are they getting into in their daily life? How well does their brain, you know, cope and, you know, fill in some of the gaps of what they're missing with, um, you know, different cues, things like that. 
So there's a lot of variability. Um, but really, you know, I, I would encourage a lot of people that if you're noticing deficits, or especially if a family member is noticing deficits, um, to at least pursue, you know, evaluation, because hearing loss is one of those things that typically creeps up on people. It's a very gradual decline over time. So one thing I say to patients really frequently is, I'm not surprised you didn't completely notice this. This was, you know, this is your normal because it happened not overnight. You didn't wake up with it, but it happened very, very gradually over a number of years. So this is what your brain is used to functioning with. But the other thing that I hear, the number one thing I hear after, you know, fittings with hearing aids and follow-up visits is I didn't know how much I was missing. And I didn't know how hard I was working to fill in all the gaps of what I was missing. Wow. There's, there's data to demonstrate one out of every four patients that could benefit from a hearing aid actually have a hearing aid. Yes. And if we extend that further down your hearing loss journey, this is a little nuts, uh, but it's thought that one out of every 50 patients that could qualify for a cochlear implant have a cochlear implant. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. We can even take that even earlier in the hearing loss journey. Like are people getting audiograms? I mean, I, I think, you know, it, it, like if someone's mentioning, do you have hearing loss? I think that the historical paradigm in human, in human nature has been like, that's a part of getting older. Well, no, I mean, we, we have, we, we can help, we, we can help people and, uh, and maybe much earlier than people ever thought we could. Yeah. One of my constant things that I discuss with patients and, and I completely understand that there is a stigma with hearing loss, wearing hearing aids, cochlear implantation. But one of the things I very frequently say is, you know, in your opinion, what would make you feel older or, you know, like you're deteriorating anything like that? not hearing somebody well, misunderstanding what's being said, isolating yourself in social situations, or wearing a very tiny device that I promise no one will notice and will, you know, get you up to where you need to be. And usually, you know, the answer is the first one. Absolutely. Yeah. All about improving lives. So thank you both. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lucas, we'll turn to you now, uh, talk a little bit about listening exercises, um, or maybe anything that can be done to reverse or help minimize hearing loss. Um, and going into that a bit. Yeah. So this is a big topic for me because a lot of listening practice is needed for cochlear implant patients, but there's also a lot of activities that people with hearing loss that don't have hearing aids or people that wear hearing aids can take advantage of. Um, the main thing that I find is very helpful is really advocating for yourself. Um, I know I've seen a lot of people kind of just nodding and going along with what's being said or, you know, laughing when everyone else is laughing, but missing out on the joke. Um, you know, I always tell people to speak up for yourself, ask for repetition if you need to, ask for clarification, because a lot of times, you know, that's what people do. They stand in the corner they don't ask people, you know, what they said, and, and they find out that they're missing out on a lot of the jokes or conversation with friends and family. So, you know, making sure that you're setting yourself up for these situations. Um, some good things to do is to make sure that the person has your attention before they start speaking to you. I've heard dozens and dozens and maybe even like thousands of times people say, oh, my wife or my husband tries to talk to me from the other room and I can't hear them. You know, talking through a wall is difficult. Adding that with a, a hearing loss as well makes it even more challenging. Um, you know, making sure you have good lighting on the person that you're speaking with, reduce that distance, um, and, you know, really, again, just advocating for yourself. Um, in terms of different, like, listening activities, we provide our cochlear implant patients with different apps that can be used. So there's free apps on, you know, an Android or an iPhone that actually allow you to do daily listening exercises. Um, some of them are actually kind of fun. Um, so you will hear two different words and you have to pick which word you heard. And then it'll tell you if it was right or wrong. And then you can listen to the differences between the two. Um, this is very helpful for cochlear implant patients because, like I said earlier, they're learning how to hear all over again. Um, but it's also helpful for hearing aid patients. You know, with hearing aids, this is also a different way of hearing. Um, people say at first things sound tinny or like you're talking through a microphone. But, you know, the more that you hear different sounds, your brain is able to put that information together so quickly. Um, there's also a program out there. It's called Amptify. And it's a 12-week program that actually assigns you like a hearing mentor. 
Um, they assign you homework to do, which sounds a little daunting, but is certainly helpful. Um, and it's a 12 week course to just make sure that you're following these exercises and really getting the benefit um, from either your cochlear implant or your hearing aid. Um, and then there's also speech pathologists out there that are able to help, you know, that specialize in this auditory or training exercises. So, you know, there's a lot of options out there, and I think it's certainly helpful for patients both with hearing aids and cochlear implants if they're, um, you know, really trying to get the most out of these devices. Yeah, absolutely. And exciting to hear that a lot of them are free apps on mm -hmm. your phone. That's, so. that's the only thing I look for is free apps. So. Yeah, I know. Who wants to pay? Cool. All right. Um, Dr. Lucas, another question for you, um, a little bit separate from this, but talking about earwax. Um, can earwax lead to hearing loss? And is there any way to know if a problem is hearing loss or just simply wax buildup? That's a great question. Um, the majority of my patients come in and are like, I think I have hearing loss. It's probably just wax. A lot of the times it's not, but sometimes it is. Um, so yes, hearing uh, ear wax can cause hearing loss. Um, it's, it's a plug in your ear, basically. So if it's impacted so much, it's going to cause at least a mild degree of hearing loss. Um, you know, when you see uh, your family physician, they typically should be looking in your ears. But if you're concerned about it, I would certainly have it checked by a professional. Um, I've seen horror stories of people getting those little video cameras off of Amazon and, you know, the tips breaking off in their ear. I've seen horrible ears from, from those types of devices. So I always say get your ear checked from a professional if you're concerned about that. Um, a little bit of earwax is helpful healthy to have in the ear, um, but certainly if it's blocking it, it can cause some degree of hearing loss. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, before we go into our next question, I see a lot of questions coming in from the audience. So just a plug to keep them coming and thank you for sending. Um, but with that, let's hop, hop to our next question to talk about Meniere's disease. So Dr. Hunter, um, we definitely received a few questions about this. Can you discuss the disease and the effect on hearing loss. Yeah, this is actually, I think, kind of a controversial topic, at least in the world of otology, neurotology currently. So uh, Meniere's disease, the most recent definition was defined in 2015 by the Barony Society uh, that's defined as episodic vertigo that can last from 20 minutes now upwards of 12 hours. Uh, the definition that preceded 2015 was 20 minutes to four hours. This might give us give you a little understanding of where we understand Meniere's disease to be, uh, but patients would have fluctuating hearing loss with that vertigo episodes. That hearing loss is typically a low frequency hearing loss, and then as I mentioned earlier, tinnitus is a symptom of hearing loss, so that patients are going to have concomitant tinnitus with that, and patients are also going to describe ear fullness or oral fullness, as we would call it, or ear pressure. Um, that was first described by a Frenchman in 1861. That's 160, almost 163 years ago. Um, I mean, the definition just changed in 2015 by a bunch of older physicians sitting around a table determining this is the new definition. So um, the thought process behind Meniere's disease is that it's a dysregulation of fluid within the inner ear. So it turns out another Frenchman in 1927 identified a common theme amongst these patients who had these symptoms that they had these swollen fluid sac in their ear bone and that that was the diagnosis or the, the underlying cause of Meniere's disease. So the, the traditional and probably arguably the still most common initial treatment patterns for this is to offer a low salt diet and a diuretic with the thoughts that that's going to control that fluid dynamic within the inner ear. Um, the problem with that thought is one, not everybody responds to that. I, I, I can't quote the number off the top of my head, but we know from patients who've passed on and donated their temporal bones, their ears to science uh, when we look in those ears, not everybody that had Meniere's disease when they were alive had these swollen sacs. And sure enough, people that had these swollen sacs never had Meniere's disease. So we know it's not tried and true together. Um, so there is a, a long story history treatment algorithm for Meniere's disease. As I mentioned, low salt diet, diuretic. Uh, we do steroid injections. We talk about antibiotic injections. Kind of maybe the end of that algorithm is what we would do is we'd actually cut the balance nerve 
And interestingly enough, that procedure is becoming less and less frequent. We're just not doing that as much. And I think that's because, and this comes to where the controversy lies, is that many, many, including myself, uh, look at it as maybe a migraine of the ear. So we use the term a vestibular migraine. And so when you go back and look at Prosper Meniere's original treatise, it was 25 patients in Paris in 1861. Every single one of them also had headaches. And so there's been a lot of research over the past 20 years that has looked at the potential connection between treating this as a, a migraine. And we're not talking about your typical uh, migraine abortive medications, what we call the tryptans, what a neurologist would prescribe. We, we don't find the same response. But we, re we recently presented and we have a paper under um, consideration currently about how the treatment paradigm has shifted from a Meniere's perspective in the past 15 years. And so, um, listen, I mean, what I tell patients, and a lot of times patients come in because they've gone down the Meniere's route. I mean, they're looking for a new solution, a different approach. I mean, my job, as I mentioned earlier, my job is to improve your quality of life and whatever works, I'll take it. I mean, there's, as I said, I, there's a lot more basic science behind the potential connection of a vestibular migraine. And there's thoughts why perhaps the diuretic and low salt diet would work. Um, but the thought process is that we use the term, it would burn out or the ear would burn out when we talk about Meniere's disease. There's a risk that you'd eventually lose your hearing over time in Meniere's disease. Well, if, if you approach it from a migraine angle, migraine is a hypervascular disorder, um, we're starting to wonder if that's also causing damage to the cochlea. And while it's not a low blood flow because that would cause ischemia, like a heart attack of the ear, it's like over too much blood flow and potentially that's driving the hearing loss in the, the ear. But not everybody, there's the old definition used to be definite, probable, possible Meniere's disease. We've kind of gone away from that because maybe not everybody has those symptoms. Uh, I mean, it's a, amazing. Whoever marketed Meniere's disease, like every physician knows Meniere's disease, that, that was a marketing genius because many patients come in with a Meniere's disease diagnosis, but at the end of the day, I mean, it's just like a, an ER physician. I mean, it's amazing ER physicians know about that. It's awesome. But um, that the hearing loss is a risk, but it doesn't necessarily mean it will happen. Uh, but I do think patients who have been challenged with Meniere's disease or whatever the underlying cause and I mean, whatever we want to call it, the longer patients are dealing with it, the greater the chance they're going to have a hearing loss associated with it. Okay. Uh, and with that, do hearing aids or cochlear implants work for people who have Meniere's disease? So um, I mentioned the, the, the typical textbook board answer is a low frequency hearing loss. And I'll let Anna talk about trying to aid a low frequency hearing loss. That is not the easiest thing in the yeah. world to do. Um, yeah. but it, hearing aids, I mean, they can work same with the cochlear implant. Interesting mm -hmm. enough with a cochlear implant, you can still get the fluctuations of the vertigo with the cochlear implant. So whatever is still undergoing can still occur. You can actually get fluctuations in the functionality of the implant. Uh, and there's different things we can do to minimize that not only in terms of the surgical approach, but post-operatively. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, they can work, uh, it, I mean, I, I'll defer to Dr. Bixler to talk about kind of different patterns are easier for her than others. <laughs> yeah, no. And that's, that's a great way to talk about how, you know, hearing loss is, is usually different at every pitch. You know, we do have flat hearing losses across the, the pitch or frequency range, but oftentimes it's different across them. And acoustically, it can be really difficult to fit a low upward sloping to normal into the higher pitches hearing loss, because essentially whenever we're plugging the ear canal to correct that low pitch gain, those larger sound waves, we have to then artificially fill in the high frequency range where that hearing is normal. So oftentimes patients report a sound quality that's really abnormal, just, you know, not pleasant to them. Um, you know, certainly in, you know, cases of Meniere's or fluctuating hearing loss, hearing aids can absolutely work nicely. It's just super variable patient to patient. Um, the best cases that I've seen are, you know, patients that that are super willing to come into the office pretty frequently for me and not completely long-term, but at least frequently enough so that I can get a good gauge of, you know, test retest between, you know, some, some active changes for them. And, you know, some patients have a more stable kind of baseline hearing loss and then an active change. And if I can, can monitor and, you know, program hearing aids to accommodate for 
you know, that kind of more baseline and then an active change. And a patient also has some self-manipulation within the bounds of, you know, where I think they're going to shift to that can really work nicely for them, but it's super variable patient to patient. And a lot of times it, it just means that you're going to need to spend more time with your audiologist, which I know is not ideal coming into the office all the time, but it's how we'll get the best outcome we can. Okay. Well, thank you. And uh, before we just close out uh, this topic, any new treatments or research uh, that you want to highlight, um, Dr. Hunter? Um, so there's um, a company, I think they're Seattle, that they are currently, or they actually, I think, closed the clinical trial. I mean, so people are looking at delivering a medication to the ear that might be more beneficial to uh, these patients. So that that company is called Sound Pharmaceuticals, um, and it's a proprietary um, uh, molecule that's approaching it from a traditional Meniere's disease side. Uh, on the migraine side, um, it's, I mean, we are treating these patients I mean, honestly, this is all off-label. There is no FDA-approved medication for Meniere's disease or vestibular migraines. Um, as I mentioned, the traditional abortive medications for uh, migraineurs with a headache from a neurology side, we don't normally see responses. Uh, but there are a new class of receptor antagonists that are coming out for those migraineurs that we're a little intrigued by within um, the vestibular um, migraine population. I can't believe I'm quoting this on a health webinar, but there's actually a very interesting New Yorker article about vestibular migraines that actually one of my patients turned me on to uh, that talked about the potential connections. I have no idea how accurate that is in terms of uh, <laughs> the citations, but um, we still don't, I mean, we're, the controversy and how to approach these makes it difficult to, to do large studies. Um, and so outside of that sound pharmaceutical study, uh, which I believe Jefferson did participate in. I, I believe that that phase is closed. Um, the migraines still is kind of more of a retrospective exploration currently with no large scale multi-center trials, nothing prospective. Um, but again, we go back to here, here we're talking about two diagnoses. And honestly, I think it's a Venn diagram. It's the same thing. I mean, this is all clinical um, symptomatology. I mean, we we don't there's controversy on a test. There's supposedly, there's one test that some people use to define whether they, they have the disease or not, but in a sense, this is all subjective descriptors. And so being able to consistently identify these patients between, so external validity makes it very, very difficult. Okay. Well, certainly a complex topic, but thank you for uh, walking us through that. All right. Uh, Dr. Bixler, we will go back to you for our next question. Um, how can someone distinguish, distinguish between dizziness uh, versus a hearing issue or ear problem? Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I saw this question leading into it and I was, I was kind of intrigued. So again, it kind of plays into what I talked about before where these organs are, are still housed in the inner ear capsule. So they can coincide. They also may have absolutely nothing to do with each other. Um, there, there can be disorders that happen to each individual organ. Um, you know, the best, best way to, you know, tell and figure out if, you know, one issue is coinciding with another is come in for some diagnostic testing, um, you know, discuss with, you know, your ear, nose and throat doctor, audiologist, what symptoms you're having, then we can create a game plan of what type of testing do we want to do? What do we want to look at to really hone in on each individual part of the system to make sure we're also not missing out on anything because these are different organs. We don't want to make, we want to make sure that we're not over, you know, overseeing, uh, you know, or, or looking over um, something that could be happening. Um, that's a completely separate issue from something else that's happening. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, Dr. Lucas, we will turn to you now. Um, what are the main organic sources of hearing loss and is there any science behind it? Yeah, um, I think it's first important to understand basically, I guess, how hearing works. Um, you know, it seems like this magical thing that just happens to us, but it is a pretty complex process. Um, so essentially, there's three parts of our ears, the outer, the middle, and then the inner ear itself. Um, the, the outer ear consists of your actual ear that you can see and your ear canal. Um, your middle ear is a space that actually houses three tiny bones. Um, 
Trivia question, if you ever get asked, the tiniest bone in the body is actually found within the middle ear itself. Um, so you're welcome for that. Um, and then there's the inner ear itself. Um, so the sound actually travels through your ear canal and it hits your eardrum, which basically just vibrates and moves those little bones in the middle ear. Um, when those bones are moved, it actually changes fluid within your inner ear itself. And then there's little hair cells that are within our inner ear. And when they move in response to that fluid change, what that does is actually send signals to your hearing nerve, which then sends that signal up to the brain. Um, so essentially there's three different types of hearing loss. Um, one of them is called a conductive hearing loss. That could be something like wax in the ear, foreign body in the ear, um, could be a problem with fluid or congestion in the ear, problems with those little bones. Those are all issues that the sound is actually not being able to be transmitted or conducted into the ear, which can cause some degree of hearing loss. Um, there's also something called a sensory neural hearing loss, which I know we mentioned a couple times within this webinar. Um, typically, those types of hearing losses can be due to age, noise exposure. Um, there's some types of medications that are ototoxic, so can cause some degree of hearing loss. Um, you know, genetics can play a role into this, noise exposure. There's, there's a couple factors that can actually affect our inner ear, which is where that sensory neural hearing loss would be. Um, and then there's also something called a mixed hearing loss. So that's when you have a little combination of both. So you could have some sensory neural hearing loss and then maybe, you know, wax blocking the ear or fluid in the ear, which just adds an additional layer on top of that. Um, so we kind of break it down into those three main types of hearing loss. Um, we're able to diagnose which type you have based on the hearing tests, taking a look in the ear, seeing what we you know, can find. And then there's also varying tests that we can do at your appointment to confirm that. Okay. And really interesting to hear the science of hearing. I know I don't think about it that often. So I try to keep it pretty simple, but you know, it's, it just happens for us. So we don't really think about it too often. Yeah, exactly. Thanks for breaking that down. Okay. Uh, Dr. Hunter, can you talk to us about surgeries? Um, are there any surgeries available to regain hearing? Yeah, I, I think that's a great follow-up to Lauren's response. So while we can remove wax in the office, and admittedly that is not the cause of hearing loss very often, um, pretty much everything between that wax, the eardrum, the bones, um, we can fix. And when it gets to be that cochlea component, uh, that's when we're starting to talk about either a hearing aid or a cochlear implant. And so, I mean, while I would have no reservation doing implants day in and day out, um, here, I told you the utilization rate's poor. Um, really, I mean, a, a lot of what I do is fixing holes in the eardrum uh, which is motiv motivates many patients because of the hearing loss. Um, you can get a skin cyst in your ear, what we call a cholesteatoma. Um, it's really the, the presence of skin in a location where it's not supposed to be. Uh, and that can erode the hearing bones and lead to a conductive hearing loss. Um, chronic inflammation from that can also lead to a sensory or neural component. So that those patients do develop a mixed component. But one of my a very common surgery that I perform is the procedure and removing that cyst, rebuilding the eardrum and rebuilding the, in a sense, rebuilding the ossicular chain to connect that eardrum to the inner ear. Um, but yeah, really everything lateral to that, that cochlea, um, if there's something conceivably broken, conceivably we, we can fix it. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, Dr. Bixler, let's talk a little bit about concussions. Can hearing changes from a concussion be reversed or even corrected? That's a great question. Um, so I think we have to think about, you know, potential, potential causes for hearing loss with concussion. So anytime there can be trauma to the head, neck, anything like that, we can have trauma to the inner ear as well. Um, now that trauma can, you know, lead to a sensory neural hearing loss that ends up being more permanent. Um, in some rare, rare cases, and Dr. Hunter can definitely talk on this more than I can, um, you know, issues like a uh, fluid leak in the inner ear, anything like that. With, and that's with somebody who is already prone to that disorder with some head trauma. 
can sometimes be repaired. Um, but you know, if there was head trauma that was severe enough to damage the, the cochlea and the inner ear, oftentimes that, that, you know, usually cannot be repaired. Um, and then we're going to have to assess the severity of hearing loss. You know, what routes do we go from there? Um, things like that as well. Yeah, there's, okay. there's actually not a lot we know about that. Um, What's interesting about this is the Boston Marathon bomber, was that 2013 or 2012? I forget. That mm -hmm. bombing occurred right around the corner from the emergency room at um, uh, Brigham Women's uh, in Boston. Mm -hmm. And so one of my colleagues up there uh, has looked into exploring kind of what happens in the inner ear in these patients. And it's not just the inner ear. I mean, I've seen patients with such bad head trauma we're worried about shearing of the auditory nerve or auditory cortex issues that when Anna and I are talking and Lauren and I are talking from the ear, I mean, we're, we're just boosting that signal to the, to the nerve. And if there's injury or damage along that nerve or, and really the best way I describe it, and this goes deeper to Lauren's description, it's almost like five telephone wires with connectors before it gets to the auditory cortex. If there's damage at one of those connectors or along one of those wires, if we're not getting it to the auditory cortex, which is kind of right above the ear, um, there's going to be a hearing loss. And so while we can correct and try to address things within the cochlea and lateral out, anything deep, um, that is a very active area of research and interest. Um, so, I mean, as Anna said, I mean, there's a, a whole host of, I think severity plays a big role. I think we've all seen patients do fine with the hearing aid, do fine with the cochlear implant, but we, we've also seen the severity where a cochlear implant didn't work. I was actually, that just, you bringing that up made me think too of, um, there's, there's, you know, new research going, coming in from um, VA locations as well in veterans who are, are blast victims in terms of not only there's peripheral hearing loss, but there's also some auditory processing disorders, which was what Dr. Hunter was kind of keying into um, in terms of, you know, there are nonlinear functions, whether it's in the cochlea, auditory nerve, or higher up pathway to the auditory cortex. And that can certainly pose a lot of issues too, in terms of um, utilization of a hearing aid. Um, it kind of hits on, you know, what Dr. Lucas was talking about too, of, of auditory processing training techniques, because those can really accompany correcting the peripheral hearing loss. But, um, you know, we're very curious to see a lot of that. Um, and some of the, the uh, research that's come out from VAs in terms of tinnitus, um, you know, not quite as severe of hearing loss, more mild hearing loss, but a very heavy auditory processing component, they're really starting to fit more of those patients with hearing aids. And the, the great news is there have been really positive outcomes in minimal um, gain hearing aids for those patients. Now that does have to go hand in hand with this auditory training. It's really a full program, but it's really exciting to see some of those positive changes for patients. Yeah, absolutely. Very exciting to hear. Um, thank you for sharing that research. Cool. All right. Dr. Lucas, we will turn to you. I think we have about two more questions before we go into our live questions from the audience. Um, so Dr. Lucas, can you discuss inner ear crystals and how they may affect hearing? Yeah, of course. So the inner ear crystals don't necessarily affect your hearing. Um, Dr. Bixler mentioned before that they are two separate systems. So your hearing system and your balance system, although they are very close together. Um, it sounds a little crazy to hear that you have crystals in your inner ear, um, but they're just calcium carbonate crystals. And what they do is actually help us in response to like head and body movements. So ideally they are housed in one spot, but occasionally, you know, due to head injury or just, you know, quick movements of the head, some people do notice like a quick spinning sensation or when they, you know, turn over in bed or, or turn their head a certain way, they do feel that quick vertigo or, or spinning sensation. Um, ideally, those crystals in that sense are actually dislodged from where they're supposed to be. Um, so what they do are they're kind of like free floating in a space where they're not supposed to be and essentially making you feel like you're moving when you're actually not. Um, good news about that is there are some quick maneuvers that can be done to help place them back where they're supposed to be. Um, and there's also testing that can be done in our office to quickly assess, you know, if those crystals are loose, that way we can make the recommendation to, you know, treat them and, and get you feeling, feeling better. 
Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, Dr. Hunter, a uh, quick question for you about injections. Um, would an injection of steroids in an affected ear with hearing loss be beneficial if oral steroids did not work? Yes. Yeah, so uh, we talk about that in the setting of sudden sensorineural hearing loss, and there's no set definition of that. Um, but the general consensus is a 30 decibel difference um, between the two ears, whether that's at one frequency or a combination of say three consecutive frequencies. But it, again, there's no strict definition, uh, but the American Academy of Otolaryngology. So my, I guess my academy, there's, I think, 12 or 13,000 of us otolaryngologists in the country uh, produced a clinical practice guideline. So this is a guideline that looks at, includes audiologists, includes a, a multidisciplinary team to look at the literature, to provide literature to your general ENT in the community. And so the recommendation in the sudden hearing loss presentation is to offer steroids, uh, not necessarily telling whether that's oral, an injection, or a combination. When we actually look at the data, and there's been a lot of data on this, uh, it's a kind of a wash on the first line therapy. You could go either route, or I shouldn't say either, oral, IT, or a combination, and the outcome is roughly the same. But that clinical practice guideline, which again summarizes the literature, uh, suggests that if you don't respond to oral up front, that an intratympanic injection is definitely advisable. Uh, the key here is in a timely fashion. <clears throat> so ideally, you want to get these steroids in as quickly as possible. Steroids are an anti-inflammatory agent, and so we're presumably treating an inflammatory process. And so ideally, we try to offer that within, I mean... If you look at the data, different studies look at 72 hours, two weeks, and four weeks. So for patients that generally present beyond a month, <clears throat> I tell them that. And most of the time, it's like, I, I, I've never seen somebody respond that late. On the flip side, this is a little ludicrous, but the response rate with steroids up front is still only 30 to 40%. And the problem with the literature is you have multiple different definitions of what defines success. So <clears throat> yes, it's definitely an option. Um, it, it, it's con consideration of a number of factors, time, um, and how the other year is doing. And I mean, I've, I've had some patients, was this sudden? Was this longstanding? I mean, if, I mean, if this is a longstanding issue, I mean, being an anti-inflammatory agent, it, it's, it's not going to move the needle. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And I think with that, uh, we can go into our live questions, um, before we close out the evening. So for our first question, I will just throw it out to whoever wants to answer. So feel free to jump in. Um, so to kick us off, this person is wondering, do cochlear implants improve the ability to listen to music? That's a great question. Um, music is one of the hardest things with a cochlear implant, because again, it's a completely different sound quality. Um, that's not to say that you can't appreciate music with a cochlear implant. Um, you know, there's talking about training. There are different training exercises that can be done with music for cochlear implants. Um, you know, what I always tell my patients is songs and music that you're familiar with are going to be a lot easier for you because you have an idea of, you know, the lyrics and what the rhythm is and what the, the song sounds like. But newer music is, is going to be challenging because essentially you're putting this information together for the first time. Um, so again, not saying that it's it's not able to be done, but it does take a lot more practice with a cochlear implant than it normally would with a hearing aid. And style, and well, I mean, I'm not really that musically inclined. Is style sorry. the right word? Style or the, uh, the yeah, style, it, that matters too. So it depends on like jazz, classical, rock, rap. Mm -hmm. um, so when people do investigations, they try to parse that out. Um, but yeah, I, I echo everything Lauren stated. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, next question here, uh, Dr. Hunter, I believe this one is for you. When will totally internal cochlear implants be available? So that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> they've investigated this for a number of years. So there are well, I guess it doesn't matter. The The older one, so Cochlear is the world's largest market share. Cochlear is a brand based in Australia. Cochlear Americas is the American counterpart. 
They ran a study in Australia about 20 years ago, uh, Medel, which is based down at Innsbruck, Austria. They ran a study in Europe just recently. And the most common complaints are that patients were hearing body sounds that they did not want to hear. And I can maybe appreciate that. Um, interestingly enough, Steam, or I should say Medtronic, so in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, they are currently actively doing a clinical trial at Mayo, Rochester. Uh, they are implanting 10 patients with a completely implantable implant. I think... I forget. They, I think they have four under the belt. I don't know the qualification criteria. Um, I, I don't know the status of that. They haven't released any data on that. But up until today, um, no one can get around the internal body sounds that people don't want to hear. And, and that can include like hearing your eyeballs move and hearing the bones creak. I mean, at the end of the day, patients weren't happy with that quality of sound. So we're knocking on the door, but it's not quite there yet. Okay. Yeah. Interesting to hear that. You wouldn't really think about um, those internal sounds, but, you know, cool to hear that work is being done. All right. They are getting a lot smaller on the outside as well. So I think when people think about, you know, not only hearing aids, but cochlear implants, like, yes, it is a little visible on the ear, but, you know, we can match it to hair color and, and there's smaller devices that are just like a little disc that can just sit right on the head. So, you know, appearance, yes, I can understand um, and appreciate why people wouldn't want it, but they are getting smaller and smaller. Okay. Um, another question here, a little bit more technical, but uh, can hearing aids, uh, do they need to be removed when people swim? Um, and what about a cochlear implant? That's a great question. Um, so hearing aids are always attempting to become as waterproof as possible. There have been a few attempts in you know the last eight to 10 years at a, a waterproof hearing aid. Those have all failed tremendously in my opinion um, because they were advertised to patients of swim in the pool, do laps with these. It is an, an electronic device that must have ports to microphones. Um, when we think about sound transfer into a hearing aid, we want to have really good integrity going into those microphones. And there are also some digital functions that we need multiple microphones on those devices to, um, you know, utilize some of the digital features like noise reduction and focus of, of microphones, things like that. So it's a really hard thing to control for. I will say hearing aids are consistently becoming much more moisture resistant than they used to be. Um, so, you know, I'm never worried about a patient, you know, getting stuck in the rain or perspiring, you know, when they're exercising, anything like that. I do still advise that they take you know, their hearing aids out when they're showering, swimming, because I want the hearing aids to last as long as they possibly can for them. Um, the other nice thing too, that, that we're always working on, and I was, you know, kind of excited that we got this new equipment in the office is a system called Redux. And it's just, you know, a very advanced um, uh, hearing aid and any electronic, uh, you know, moisture vacuum. So it essentially is going to measure the amount of moisture coming out of a device. And that's a good way for us to gauge for our patients. How often do we need to see them back to keep their hearing aids working as well as they can? Because the number one cause of, of hearing aid device failure over three, four, five, six years is moisture damage. Um, so if we can keep that working for a patient and, you know, keep the hearing aids maintaining the goals of their hearing loss, we're going to get better longevity out of them. Um, I think we'll get there eventually, but we're not there yet. Okay. Well, we'll stay tuned. <laughs> and cochlear implants are a little different. Um, all three manufacturers out there actually have some type of device that either their cochlear implant can sit in or waterproof battery that can go in. So I would say um, cochlear implants are a lot actually a little more waterproof. Like they actually recommend you can swim in them. You can, you know, do water activities, water aerobics with the device on. Um, they do come with a drying kit too. So I say after you're done doing those activities, throw it in the drying kit just for safe measures, but they do recommend or encourage you to wear them with those devices on. Okay. Well, thank you both. All right. Next question here. What is the connection, if any, between hearing loss and headaches? Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, that's a, it goes back to the discussion about a migraine. So what is the definition of a migraine? I recognize that we're playing family feud and I say migraine, 98% survey says headache, but we're actually, when we talk about sudden hearing loss, there's data to suggest and support potentially treating a sudden hearing loss as a migraine. 
So um, I don't know the data off the top of my head about those patients with migraines and hearing loss. Um, we know that 60% of traditional migraineurs, the headaches um, are going to have dizziness. And we recognize a lot of people with dizziness have migraines or headaches. Uh, we are starting to question what the definition of a migraine is. Um, many people, that 98% family feud response would be like sensitivity, bright lights, worst headache in the world, got to turn off the light. But I mean, sometimes people will come in with sinus pressure and they, they say they have sinus disease. Well, has anybody worked you up for that? Yeah, it's all negative, never been treated for anything. Well, we're now starting to question maybe what people have been characterizing as sinus headaches or fullness or pressure in the back of the head might be a migraine. Uh, that's maybe like the definition of migraine, not for the patient, but again, we don't have a test. So I, I don't know um, the link if someone has a traditional migraine headache in terms of the risk of hearing loss. I, I It's an interesting question. I, I don't know that. I actually don't know if there's data on that, um, but it is something that I actively talk to patients about. It, it is something that we routinely ask patients about if they have a history of it. Uh, it, it just helps discuss potentially underlying differentials. Um, and I guess with that question or with the thought process on the pathophys, is it kind of a blood blood supply issue or over overloading a blood to the ear that's it's driving driving the sim symptoms potentially? Okay. All right. Thank you. Next question here. Uh, this person is wondering if someone can speak to bone conduction in plants. Sure, I'd love to talk about them. Um, so bone conduction implants are, are implants that are really focused on um, you know, two, two separate hearing losses. So there can be a conductive or a mixed hearing loss, or it can be a person with single-sided deafness. And essentially in the single-sided deafness category, we're attempting to um, you know, conduct the sound from this side over to the better hearing ear. Um, you know, one great thing is cochlear implants have been approved for single-sided deafness. So I think that is certainly going to take over that realm for single-sided deafness, which I'm excited for because outcomes can be a little varied with bone anchored hearing devices for single-sided deafness. Um, still a good option and something we always want to have in our tool belt for patients. But, you know, I, I really see um, bone anchored hearing aids as more of a treatment for conductive and mixed hearing loss. Um, so essentially, when we're thinking about, like Lauren was talking about earlier, the, you know, the parts of the ear, how we conduct sound through, if we can bypass the outer and the middle ear and stimulate the cochlea through bone vibration, bone conduction, then we can bypass the hearing loss that's occurring there. Um, the benefit to that is um, that, you know, it's a very direct sound stimulation, especially if a patient has a true conductive hearing loss, meaning that the hearing in their inner ear is within normal limits. Um, very, very easy correction. It's just such a direct stimulation, um, really easy to work with. Um, oftentimes we'll see, you know, bone anchored hearing aids in patients with, you know, middle ear disease that could not be revised with surgery or, um, you know, a patient with atresia or microsia, very, very small ear canals that we could not fit them with a hearing aid. So that's not an option for them. Um, so, you know, and those can come in, in kind of various shapes and sizes. There are bone anchored hearing aids that are truly, you know, kind of bone anchored into the skull and there's an abutment. And then we have a device that kind of snaps on the outside. That's how we conduct sound. There are also bone anchored hearing aids that, um, you know, have kind of an inside implant and are more of a magnet in stimulation. So there's a huge variety. Um, but again, of course, all of that starts with evaluation and, you know, making sure that somebody's a good candidate. One thing with, with mixed hearing loss that we always want to consider is how long is this, this person going to stay within um, appropriate bone conduction hearing scores to maximize their benefit with a, with a device? Because with anything, you know, surgical, surgical, even though it can be really easy, we don't want somebody to go through something they don't have to if they're going to have to go to another option eventually. Um, so all of that's taken into consideration, but they're, they're really cool devices. And we even have ways to you know, verify their function, measure their output. We have a little skull simulator that actually measures the output of those. So there's a lot of cool stuff that goes into it. We really enjoy working with them. Yeah, absolutely. That does sound pretty cool. So thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Okay. 
Next question here um, is about Meniere's disease again. Um, and apologies for any mispronunciation here, but is beta histine an effective treatment for Meniere's? There we go. Uh, so beta histine, like everything else in America, is not FDA approved. Um, for my background, where I train for residency and fellowship, it was not part of the teaching curriculum. Uh, when I went to UT Southwestern, it was something that my partners would offer. It's very common in Germany. Um, it's a common medication used for uh, Meniere's disease. Um, it's a fairly well tolerated medication. So I do, I have had patients managed on it. It is not something that is at the top of my line from a migraine algorithm, if you will, but I do have some discussions with patients about it. There's some interesting thoughts of how it might be working. We, we don't really know. <laughs> um, and so is it affecting maybe some histamine receptors in the brainstem? Um, and so maybe is that why it's helping those patients with Meniere's? Again, it's very well tolerated. It can be a little expensive. I mean, some pharmacies in the U.S. carry it. I know we've told people, or at least in my former practice, we tell people to go find an internet pharmacy in Canada. That seems a little sketchy, but it works. And uh, they, they can mail the beta histine to them. So I have no reservation. I mean, at the end of the day, if it works, great. But I'm, I can't tell patients right off the bat if, if it's going to work for them or not. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Bixler, a uh, question for you here. Can you talk a little bit about over-the-counter hearing aids? Would love to. So this is such a big hot topic that we've been talking about the last couple of years. Um, so the interesting thing with, with over-the-counter hearing aid legislation, um, essentially what that did was allow um, different manufacturers of devices to label their products as hearing aids. The one beneficial part of that was output limitation. So there were limits and FDA approvals for, you know, we can only go to a certain level because, of course, we don't want anybody to be damaging their hearing, um, you know, by overfitting a device to themselves. But the funny thing is, these devices have been around for years. And there are, of course, a few new ones out on the market. Um, and, you know, it really depends on where you look, but there's such a wide variety in, in devices. We can see devices that, you know, audiologists would categorize more as personal sound amplifiers. And, you know, that just, you know, kind of means what it sounds where it's just amplification of every pitch you know, all, all over, it's just turning up the volume. And those can range from anywhere from, you know, $25 to $200. And then, you know, and those can now be considered, you know, over-the-counter hearing aids. That can also range all the way up to online order hearing aids, um, which, you know, a lot of those products in, you know, last year, the year before, um, they're ranging anywhere from, you know, seven hundred to two thousand dollars for you know a pair of hearing aids. The big downfall with that is you are never going to see somebody in person for services, and you know a huge deficit I find is you know over the counter hearing aids are intended for mild to moderate hearing loss. If if somebody does not have to go through full audio, audiometric evaluation to obtain those devices, you could be really inappropriately fit. Um, so there's, you know, a, a huge gap in terms of people making sure they have access to know what their hearing loss is, to even know that they're a candidate for it at first. A lot of those companies are trying to kind of overcome that with hearing tests over the phone or hearing tests through your computer. Those are not calibrated pieces of equipment, so we can't really rely on those. Um, but, but certainly, I think the big downfall in, in those devices are, you know, less customization to an individual's hearing loss. One of the biggest factors in, you know, success with hearing aids is, you know, there are two, two main factors, in my opinion. There's fitting to, you know, appropriate amplification and audibility based on a person's hearing loss. And we actually have very specific prescriptive targets for that. And we measure hearing aid output based on an individual's hearing loss with acoustic measurements of their ear canal. So fitting, you know, appropriately and counseling patients through that fitting, because it's an adjustment too. And then that kind of rolls into my second part of it is an adjustment to hear at a normal level again. Most patients that I see that I fit with hearing aids, I take all of these very precise measurements, I go through the fitting appointment, 
I usually don't send them out the door with their full fitting target that day because they're not ready for it. I liken it to, you know, if you've been in a dark room for a long period of time and somebody just turned on the light on the big lights and full blast, you'd be pretty angry because your eyes are going to be very sensitive. Same thing with the auditory system because sensory neural hearing loss is usually a very, very gradual onset. So we need to, you know, give somebody's auditory system a little time to adapt to that. I think that's one of the biggest reasons hearing aids or over the counter devices, PSAPs end up in it for is because patients don't know what to expect. Um, and, you know, they haven't been programmed super well. Um, one way that we've tracked this, and this has been very longstanding research, is, is research called Market Track. And that tracks trends over um, you know, treatment of hearing loss, um, how people approach treating their hearing loss, and all things hearing needs. And most recent data um, reported in 2022 reported such high rates of, you know, once patients had gone through various forms of hearing aid fitting, whether that was over the counter, you know, anything online or in person, there was such high value rating in seeing somebody in person and having the care face to face. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I just find that that's going to usually be better suited. Um, so in terms of some of those devices, too, and, and specific to Jefferson, we do have a full range of, of devices that, you know, can be more cost effective, um, you know, in terms of still getting you those in-person services, but also making sure, you know, that we're not too high above, you know, what you would see online or anything like that, because, with hearing aids, unfortunately, not typically being covered by insurance, we're very cognizant of we want to make a good decision for you because that's, you know, if, if that's not financially responsible for you and your health care, it's not going to work out very well. Okay. Well, thank you for detailing that. And I like the analogy of turning on the light switch. I think, um, yeah, that definitely paints a picture. So I appreciate you detailing that. Okay. I think we have time for uh, one more question from the audience, and then I have one final question to wrap us up for the evening. Um, so this last question here, is tinnitus a precursor to dementia? I mean, I'll jump in there, but I, I mean, I'll feel free that you guys jump in. So going back to the discussion that tin tinnitus is a symptom of hearing loss. Um, for many years now, since 2011, we've known hearing loss is a linked associated with dementia or a cognitive decline. Uh, and the, an association does not mean cause and effect. It just means that those patients that had some hearing loss in their 50s actually ended up having an increased incidence of all cause dementia when they're in their 70s. And this came out of a very famous study that's still ongoing in Baltimore that started in the 50s. It was only until this past summer, uh, two studies have come out that were prospective in nature so that, that, that this looks like it's provided a cause and effect relationship. That hearing loss um, and essentially one theory to, to relay the two is that you're, you're expending listening effort and trying to hear. So again, going back to the connection with tinnitus and hearing loss, if, if you have some tinnitus, I, I would tell a patient, hey, you're having some hearing loss, you're not hearing as well as you did previously. Uh, and so that if we are able to reduce that cognitive load, reduce that listening effort, that we can delay dementia. But there's been a lot of editorials. I'm not telling patients, you get a hearing aid, you get a cochlear implant, you're not getting dementia. I don't tell them that. But for families and patients that might have that concern, that is something that we have patients consider. Um, the Lancet Commission, which is a well-regarded worldwide organization, would argue and has published that hearing loss is arguably the greatest reversible thing that we can do to help prevent dementia. I mean, again, we are three hearing healthcare practitioners. I'm not taking it away against managing hypertension, managing diabetes. Those are all factors as well. Um, but understanding that we could potentially fit a hearing aid on a patient um, to, to maybe demonstrate very similar effects of controlling your blood pressure, controlling diabetes could potentially go a long way. But those studies are fresh, literally, like, I think it was August that those came out. And so it does look like there's that cause and effect relationship. So there is potential consequences for not aiding that patient. But going back to what Dr. Bixler said, I mean, there's a whole range of people getting fitted for hearing aids. If someone comes in with normal hearing with tinnitus, I mean, we're, we're I mean, you're not going to be able to get a hearing aid to, to help potentially delay that um, if, if that were to be at risk. 
Yeah, and I would say kind of playing off of, of what you were talking about, Dr. Hunter, um, there's, you know, there there likely will be more research coming out looking at cause and effect. And certainly there's been more research looking at treatment of untreated hearing loss, negating or slowing down the effect of cognitive decline. Um, but the other half of that too is, you know, and I, I, have been really lucky. I've been able to talk to primary care physicians and, you know, different hospital settings about the risk of untreated hearing loss in misdiagnosis of cognitive decline. If you have a patient who is facing you, who has an untreated hearing loss, they're going to answer questions to the mini mental or any kind of verbal cognitive screening incorrectly. Um, the other thing too, is there's a much higher risk of rehospitalization after hospitalization. And we really link that to not being able to hear discharge instructions, things like that properly. So there are a lot of health risks that go along with it. And that's a, a lot of what we put into in terms of lobbying for coverage for hearing aids. It's something, you know, like you said, that that could be really well treated, that could affect this broad spectrum of, you know, overall quality of life and overall health. And that's, you know, more of the data we're trying to bring to the table of, you know, if we treat this, we could reduce hospitaliz hospitalization, you know, healthcare expenses, all of these different things. And, you know, as much as it's a roundabout way, we just want to, you know, have these provided to patients because we know it works so well. And that's why we love what we do, because seeing somebody get back to their daily life is what we love. But, you know, there are always these roundabout ways of having to prove that it's going to have a positive effect. <laughs> Well, thank you both. And I think with that, I will go ahead into my final question for tonight. Um, so I'm curious, what do you want attendees to take away from this webinar? And are there any questions that you would recommend patients ask their providers? Uh, so Dr. Hunter, we'll go ahead and start with you. you I was hoping you're going to select me last. Yeah, sorry. Uh, um... <laughs> Um, I, I think it, I mean, while here I deal with everybody on the hearing loss journey and cochlear implants are very near and dear to my heart. A lot of my research interests are in cochlear implants. That's the end of patient's hearing loss journey. I, I think, and this goes back to just what we were talking about this last question. I, I think patients and families should be discussing hearing loss in a more I mean, I just wish we talked about it on like we talk about diabetes. Everybody knows. I mean, there's some controversy behind this, but everybody knows what a normal blood pressure is. But like some people, it's like, you know what? I'm doing fine. I, I don't need to worry about my hearing. I mean, I, I hear my wife when I need to hear my wife. And I, I don't know. I mean, what Anna is alluding to, I, that's not the best thing. I mean, th there could be a lot of potential positive ramifications about maybe discussing hearing with uh, with your provider when it's something that you think about, um, I, and, and do understand the providers don't understand to ask about that. So, I mean, we we've talked about, is this something that we need to talk about in medical school? Is this something we need to talk about in college? Is this something that we need to talk about in high school and middle school? Is that why diabetes and hypertension is so well maybe understood in this country when hearing loss is kind of like, whatever, I, I just get older, what can I do about it? So I, I think a fair question, and it's a challenge to the pr primary care provider is like, hey, listen, I, I just listened to this webinar about hearing loss. I, I have some concerns or I have some concerns about my family. How can you help me address this? And, and they might not know how. Those, those are active areas of research and correction that we're even trying to do within the Jefferson system currently. Uh, to say like, what can you do to help me with my hearing loss? Where can you point me? Where can you help me? I, I think it's a fair question to challenge each individual PCP, GP, family practitioner, whatever it might be to say, what, what can you do to help me with my hearing loss? Absolutely. Well, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bixler, we will turn to you now. Sure. So, I mean, I would say I, I really mirror what Dr. Hunter said is just do not be shy coming to the conversation about your hearing. That does not mean, you know, that you, you come to our office, we get through diagnostic testing and, you know, you have hearing loss, you're going to be forced into hearing aids or a cochlear implant. It is always a discussion and your, your needs and your care are always a really essential part of that. Um, whenever I go over hearing test results with patients, I always say, you know, you know, if there is a degree of sensory neural hearing loss, 
we want to schedule time for us to sit down too, so I can talk about your lifestyle. And are you seeing the deficits of this hearing loss? Because if you're not, you know, I'm never going to tell somebody you have to explore treatment for an issue that is not impacting your functionality, the, you know, things you do on a daily basis. It's something we want to monitor and make sure we keep, you know, an eye on for you, but there's never any pressure to necessarily do anything about it. But I think once you have that knowledge of there could be this underlying issue, it gives you more power to go about your life and maybe even see where places I could be doing better, or could I be making life easier for myself by you know, treating this issue? Um, but just don't be shy about, you know, coming to the table. We, I hope we've shown tonight, we all love talking about this and we really love discussing this with patients and, you know, it, it just something we always want to feel very welcoming about. Absolutely. Advocating for yourself. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Lucas to close us for the evening. Yeah. I just wanted to thank everyone for joining. It's you know, amazing to see how many people actually, you know, are taking that first step and want to learn more about hearing loss and treatment options. I was also amazed at how many questions actually came in. It kind of opens my eyes that, you know, as much as there is out on the internet, people still have questions. Um, Google is not usually the best source, but, um, you know, my thing is to advocate, like just coming in and, and getting a test. Uh, most people, you know, when I first see them, I asked if they've ever had their hearing tested before. And I would say like 90% of people say, yeah, back, you know, in grade school, when you had to raise your hand, when you heard the beep and, you know, it's difficult for some patients who are having a new problem. They have, you know, a sudden change in their hearing or they're noticing, you know, ringing in the ears and we have nothing to compare it to. You know, it's frustrating for us when, you know, vision screenings are very routine at the physician's office, but, you know, hearing is not. So this is, you know, problems that can be undiagnosed for a long time. Um, and I think people put their hearing loss on the back burner because they can get by, you know, they think they're doing fine, but, you know, really listen to what friends and family are saying or really pay attention, you know, how much you're asking for repetition or nodding and going along with what's being said, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to make that first appointment. Um, like Dr. Bix was saying, we're never forced into, you know, pursuing hearing aids. I think it's good to kind of step away from what you read on the internet because there's a lot of information out there which tends to lead people to be very confused and really unsure about about this process and then they just let it fall on the back burner so you know we're here to help and answer any questions you have and just really break down this process for you okay well thank you clearly such an important discussion, so we appreciate it. Um, so thank you once again, Drs. Hunter, Bixler, and Lucas for your time this evening. Um, so much information was shared about hearing loss. I know I learned a ton, um, so thank you. And thank you all for attending and submitting your questions. Um, there were so many great questions tonight, so we really appreciate your participation. Uh, we will be posting an event survey so you can let us know your thoughts. Your feedback will bring more virtual events like this to you, the patients. Um, if you would like someone to contact you directly to schedule an appointment with a Jefferson Health provider, please fill out the last question in the event survey. A recording of this event will also be sent to you so you can rewatch at your convenience. And if you'd like to view other wellness webinar series events, please visit our Jefferson Health YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Jefferson Hospital. We have everything from back and neck pain to robotic surgery to planning for pregnancy, age-friendly care, and much more. If there is anything anyone here at Jefferson can do for you, please reach out to us. Thank you once again for joining and please be sure to stay safe and healthy. Have a great night. Thank you.